Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thank you for joining us today, where we are going to be addressing Flat Earther's claims that planes don't work on a globe because they would spend the whole flight nosediving to follow the curve of Earth. Yet anyone who's been on a plane knows that aside from that climb after takeoff and the descent for landing, the rest of the flight is smooth cruising for a good few hours and then you find yourself in another country. Alternatively, with just a few clicks and a few seconds, you can make people think you're in another country, thanks to Atlas VPN. Its ability to reroute your internet traffic through its servers around the world makes it much easier to hide your data from prying eyes. Best of all is it allows you to decide which country your data is routed through. This can be especially useful for websites such as streaming services that can often change the available content based on the country you're viewing from. Being able to select where your data routes through can change the content that you see on a website. For example, I was recently over in France, and often when I tried to access websites on my phone, it would automatically load French versions of the site. But using Atlas VPN allowed me to make the website think that I was still in the UK, and so it would load the English version of the site. Sign up today using my link below and you'll not only receive a whopping 85% off the regular price, but they'll also include an additional 3 months absolutely free, and all with a full 30 day money back guarantee if you aren't completely satisfied. So people often argue that if the Earth is a globe curving at 8 inches per mile squared, then planes would have to drop thousands of feet to follow the curve of Earth, else they'd fly off into space. Which is fundamentally incorrect, but first to understand all this, let's cover the mechanics of how aircraft actually fly. A plane's wing is shaped in quite a particular way, called an aerofoil. Now there are many versions of aerofoils, but the basic concept is that it forces airflow to take a longer route one side than the other to reach the other side of the wing. This actually causes the air taking the longer route to speed up relative to the air taking the shorter route. This, in turn, reduces the pressure of the air that's taking the longer route. So in planes, the longer route of the aerofoil runs over the top of the wing, which causes lower pressure above the wing than below, and subsequently tries to force the wing upwards, which is what we know as lift. This can also be affected by the angle with which the wing is relative to the flow of air, known as angle of attack. If the wing is elevated more at the front, then the path for the airflow over the wing is increased, causing more lift. However, if the angle of attack becomes too much, then it causes the airflow to stop hugging against the wing, and instead causes a stall, whereby no lift is being generated. The aerofoils can be changed throughout a flight using the flight controls. The ailerons, for example, are located on the ends of each wing, and they can move up and down. Tipping them down will increase the aerofoil effect and generate more lift on that wing. Tipping them up will decrease the aerofoil effect and reduce the lift, causing the wing to drop. And these ailerons will move opposite to each other, causing one wing to lift and one wing to drop, and that will cause the plane to roll. And of course, most planes don't just have the two wings in the middle, they also have the tail plane at the back, which has two elevators that work in a similar principle to the ailerons, but rather than opposing each other, they move in unison to produce more or less lift at the back of the plane, and thus pitch the nose up or down. Now, in level flight, the amount of lift that can be generated depends on how much air is flowing over the wing, and as planes get higher and higher, the amount of air significantly decreases, which means less lift. However, there is also then less drag, so the plane can fly faster which then brings back up the amount of air that's able to flow over the wing. Although flying faster requires thrust, and engines require air to produce thrust, meaning at higher altitude the maximum amount of thrust that the engines can produce is significantly less than at sea level, because again, there's less air. Just like how the maximum power output of car engines is less when they're used at higher elevations, because the air is thinner. When at a steady cruising altitude, the forces on the plane are balanced out. The amount of lift being produced by the wings is matching the weight of the plane, and the thrust of the engines is balancing against the drag, so the speed stays the same. In order to fly higher, you'd have to increase your thrust to increase your speed to allow you to climb into thinner air whilst still producing the same amount of lift from the wings to offset the weight of the plane. If you don't increase your speed, 
then as you climb into thinner air, the amount of lift will drop, and yet the plane still weighs the same, and so it will then fall back down. And this is the first fundamental problem with Flat Earther's ideas of planes flying over a globe. The air pressure decreases the higher you go above sea level, and that follows a pretty uniform trend all the way around the Earth. So along with the Earth curving, the pressure gradient of the atmosphere is also curving. Now, if the plane were staying on a perfect tangent above a globe, then as it flew further along, its distance to the ground would be increasing, and so it would be flying into thinner and thinner air. Eventually reaching that equilibrium where the air density and speed combining produces an amount of lift equal to the weight of the plane, so the plane can't go any higher. But it's not like the plane would just be staying pointing in that same direction as it curved around the Earth, because by a quarter of the way round, it would be pointing straight up, perpendicular to the ground. The plane would have stalled long before that, which would have naturally caused the nose of the plane to drop back down and the plane to fall, which would then cause the speed of the plane to increase and descend into thicker air, which would then cause it to generate more lift. Planes can in fact experience this in what is called fugoid oscillations. There have even been incidents of aircraft who've lost control of the elevators, causing the plane to drop into these oscillations, and it's ended up requiring the pilots to be constantly adjusting the throttle amounts to try and keep the plane level just by changing the speed. Anyway, that's slightly off topic there. The point is that planes would naturally follow the curve of the Earth just from the mechanics of the fact that the amount of lift will reduce as you gain altitude. And speaking of altitude, this is another misconception I've seen Flat Earthers making about this. That planes would have to drop thousands of feet to follow the curve of Earth. Except the altitude of a plane is its distance above mean sea level, so to follow the curve of the Earth means it wouldn't be dropping thousands of feet. It would mean it's keeping the same altitude, so it's keeping the same distance above sea level. And as for the idea of the plane having to nosedive to follow the curve of the Earth, this seems to root itself in Flat Earth the struggles to understand relative directions and the sheer size of the Earth. On a diagram with a globe and a plane flying around it, from that fixed position at the top of the screen on Earth, yes, the plane looks like it's looping down and around. But from the plane's perspective, the plane's attitude is based on the ground below them. And let's consider just how much pitch down would actually be needed. The circumference of Earth is 24,901 miles, or near enough 40,000 kilometers. Average cruising speed of a commercial airliner is 550 miles per hour, which means if a plane had the fuel to fly far enough, it would take just over 45 hours to fly all the way around the world. So 360 degrees in 45.27 hours is just under 8 degrees per hour of drop which is 0.13 degrees per minute. So, to follow the curve of Earth, the plane isn't doing some huge looping plummet, it's correcting at a rate of 0.002 degrees per second. For reference, when a plane takes off, the rate at which it's changing its pitch up is about 2 degrees per second, up to a takeoff angle of around 10 degrees. And even then, remember, every flight is different, even with the same plane. The amount of weight that the plane is carrying on the flight can vary, and more crucially, the distribution of that weight can vary quite a bit too. You have all those passengers, all that luggage, and tens of thousands of pounds of fuel, which is stored in tanks in the wings and under the central fuselage. And the wings are angled backwards, which means as the fuel load changes, the plane's center of gravity can also change. So pilots do what is called trimming the plane, this is where minor calibration adjustments are made to the control surfaces to hold the plane naturally at a level flight as much as possible, rather than having a pilot having to constantly fight the controls. You may be familiar with this if you've ever tried like a remote control helicopter or a drone. Sometimes those things just naturally try spinning in circles, but if you adjust the trim, you can get it to sit straight by itself without you having to import any changes. Well, pilots essentially are doing the same thing. So when they're at cruising altitude, if the nose of the plane is constantly drifting up slightly above the horizon, then they just adjust the trim slightly to get the aircraft to hold perfectly at the horizon. 
Well, if the horizon is constantly dropping at a steady rate of 0 0.002 degrees per second, then just a tiny amount of trim and hey presto, the plane will do exactly the same thing which from the perspective of the plane is just keeping it flying perfectly level and holding a constant altitude. If you ever happen to be getting on or off a commercial plane via the rear doors, take a look at the real stabilizer next time and you might actually see a scale just in front of it for the trim. The trim on those planes actually adjusts the pitch angle of the entire back wings rather than just the elevator themselves. That way the plane can be trimmed to fly level and still leave the pilot with the full use of the regular elevator controls. Ultimately though, the trim is irrelevant because even without it, you've got slight fluctuations in air pressure, small gusts of wind, etc. All of which would be constantly moving the plane about far more than two thousandths of a degree per second anyway. So a pilot that's constantly correcting for all of those to try and keep the plane level would be correcting for curvature anyway. And I think that is going to conclude this video. If you've enjoyed it and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.